Thanks for joining us on the other side. Today's topic is to hell and back. People whose near-death experiences have taken them to hell. Joining me now is Steve Westman. Your experience was incredible, your near-death experience. Tell us what happened. Well, I was kind of a bad boy. Um, at about 12 years old, I started drinking and uh, then later on went into drugs. Um, I was uh, walking up a, a road, um, steep hill, about a mile long, uh, and walking with traffic, and I was totally drunk, and uh, a young girl uh, who had her learner's permit um, had taken her parents' car and didn't see me in the road. It was at dusk, actually 10 years ago, and, uh, in November, and she uh, broadsided me from behind, and I hit her windshield and threw the top of it and uh, land on the ground. Um, the first aid car picked me up, and I was taken to the hospital clinically dead. So you had what we would call a near-death experience, where during this time you were clinically dead. Correct. Did you have the sensation of leaving your body, of, of being alive but not in your body? I don't remember anything other than hell. Uh, all I remember is, is seeing fire all around me. I didn't have a body. I only had a face. Um, the fire was encompassing, and the only thing I could hear was the devil's voice telling me to do this and to do that. And uh, I had no choice but to do whatever he asked. Um, I never saw the devil. Are there things you can talk about, or is it too uncomfortable to talk about what he told you to do? I don't know what he was telling me to do. The only thing I knew is that I had to do it. Um, and I don't know what I did in order to accomplish it. Um, all I know is that I was in hell. Um, and that's the way it was. There was no night, there was no day, um, and it continued for, for day after day after day. Um, this is where I was. And it was finally um, that I was rising out of the fire, and I could, I could feel movement, I could feel myself actually moving. And I wasn't paying attention to what the devil was telling me anymore. I was, I was moving away, and I was thinking, he's sending me back to earth to kill my friends, my family, my loved ones, the people that I really care for, all the things that I really treasure. Do you have Do you have any children? Yeah. It's like, imagine the thought that would go through your mind if you were told and, and you had no choice but to go back and to hurt and to maim your children, to kill them, to take all the things that you had developed for them and take it away from them. Pretty good description of hell. Best I can do. Has your life changed since your near-death experience? <laughs> Very much. Um, I, as I said, I, I was, I was, actually went back and, and was going to, I think, to 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 hurt the ones I cared for. And I saw the earth. And as soon as I saw the earth, I saw myself and my life being transformed again from an infant to the time of my my accident. Like a review of your life, so to speak, that they talk Correct. about. Okay. Correct. The accident happened, and then it was all gone again. And now it was a planet. And, and I'm thinking it through, you know, why am I seeing this? What am I doing? Where am I going? And I looked for the first time to see where I was going, and it was totally black. And, and it was only one little white speck in, in, in it. And I turned around and, and turned back around, and it got bigger and bigger. And pretty soon it was encompassing this brilliant white light all around me. And I looked behind me, and it was there. And I looked forward again. It was the face of Christ. No body, just the face of Christ. And he says, welcome, son. Tell me your life. Tell me how you lived your life. And I looked and saw him, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't even face him. I mean, it's, it's, it was too much. And when, when he spoke to me, we, he, he didn't speak with his mouth. Um, it was just thought transfer. And I told him my life and how I was born and raised. And I told him, of the time when I started drinking, and I just started the first part, and I'm a good liar. <laughs> I'm a very good liar. And I thought, I could pull it off. I could say a small lie. And I said the very first word of a lie, and he corrected me and said, no, son, I know your life. Tell me the truth. Tell me how you've lived your life. So I humbled myself, and, and I told him of, of all the bad things I've done, which are too many to, to even count on. But then he said, no, son, after I told him of my death, he said, no, you are not dead, and you do not belong in hell. You have the choice to work with me, to change. And that was the most wonderful feeling I could, I could think of. But some people I've heard describe this. They say that they went from a hell experience and then have a, uh, the light experience and see God or Christ. 
Uh, and they had some way that they prayed while they were in hell and felt they were delivered into the light. Did that happen to you? I wish I could have. <laughs> I wish I could have. Um, it was nine days of total hell. I was, clin- I was clinically dead in the hospital for ten days. Just on machines, without, just without machines keeping correct. you going. Correct. I have pictures of me in a rotating bed. Um, it's How long ago was this? Ten years ago. As you look back at it now with some time, uh, how do you know you weren't hallucinating? There, there really is no way you can tell if a person that has hallucinated the thought. Um, it's like thinking of the past, how can you ever tell if it was a dream or if it actually happened? How can you tell that this show is actually ever going to be aired? How can you tell a lot of things? Um, it's a gut feeling. It's, it's something that I never forget. It's something that has stayed with me for ten years, and it's as vivid as I possibly can ever be made on a TV screen. Um, Even though you were... Uh a bad boy before that. Uh, were you a, a believer, like a religious believer? Did you believe in heaven and hell <laughs> before that, even though you weren't behaving nicely? Uh, no. You didn't no. believe? Uh, I believe there was a God. Um, I, you know, I certainly didn't think about it for whatever, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, Has it turned your, your life around with your behavior now? Yes. I, I was, you know, intervened intravenously using drugs um, before the accident, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't do I don't do drugs anymore. Uh, I don't drink anymore. Um, Most people I know who stopped addictive behavior describe it as a spiritual deliverance, not a psychological like yours. You feel like it was a you were delivered because of that experience from your addiction. I don't know if I could say. Uh, I know that I was delivered because of, of grace only. Um, mm-hmm. I just um, have, I guess, two questions. Do you hope to educate someone like yourself who maybe has experience or thinks they have experienced the same thing that you have? Yeah, do you have like a sense of mission about this now to tell other people? Well, of course, of course. Uh, this is about the fourth or fifth time I've actually talked to a, a television show. Um, I know of, of a few of the friends that uh, I used to have that uh, I used to have selling cocaine for me, um, one of which... Um, has, has just uh, quit for, for quite a while now. Was it just drinking and drug use that you did? I mean, to go to hell at 12, yeah. or, to 12 or 15, I can't believe that's all you did. Pretty stiff punishment for that. Yeah. Well, drinking and drug use, um, I've been in jail. Um, I've, you know, done things, yes. Well, what's interesting is we've heard people who've had the sort of the positive experience who behaved perhaps a lot worse than you, so it's interesting. When we come back, we'll meet a woman who says her sins took on a demonic form to torture her. Welcome back to the other side. Our next guest says she was terrorized during her near-death experience. Joining me now is Teresa Van Otten. Tell us what led up to your near-death experience. It was five years ago, and I had had a baby three weeks after the delivery, I was inundated with blood clots that hit my lungs and my heart, Mm -hmm. Um, hundreds of them, and one will kill you. I had hundreds. Your near-death experience was truly frightening. You went out, obviously, right? Oh, yes. You were clinically dead. Absolutely. And had a near-death experience. Well, I don't call it a near-death experience when you're dead, you're dead. (laughs) Uh, There's nothing near about it, but... uh, uh, my experience was very extensive. This one, this particular part of my experience that I will share with you today was very brief, thank you, God. However, it taught me a lot. I got to see my life in review during this time, prior to having it reviewed the second time. Uh, I saw an aspect of myself that I really didn't acknowledge before then. And what I saw was rage. And I had lived my life in an extreme amount of rage my whole life. I've been abused, etc., and so forth, and I knew rage real well. And as I saw rage, it came at me. It was very real. It was large and dark. And ominous, and it took on a form. It did. It was it was human like, however it was beast like as well. It was dark, had very beady eyes and sharp teeth. 
he was in rage and he was coming after me and he wanted me to know for a certain fact that I wasn't who I was, that I was him and he was me. And that I would always be him. And in that moment, I knew inside of me, somehow I knew that he was of me, but that I wasn't him and he weren't me. And I asked him, if you were me, how could you be me now? And he couldn't answer me. And that's when I told him, no more, you will be of me no more. You will never be of me no more. You took the stand. I took the stand. Yes, and, I did. And what happened? And he left. Uh -huh. He left. Great. And then he had a visitor come after him. And this one was fear. And I had been very fearful all my life. And it was kind of like pig-like swine, kind of. But it was human, too. And his hands were curled and... It was gnarling and gnashing about. It was chasing me. It was chasing me so fast and I was running so hard. And all of a sudden, I just couldn't run anymore. And I got determined and I turned around and, and he said, Why do you not run from me? I said, I will run from you no more. And he said, Oh, but you'll never be able to run fast enough because I'm you and you are me. And I said, no, 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 you are of me, but you will never, ever chase me again because I won't run. So you said no to rage and you said no to fear? Yeah. Did you get to come back? I left from there and went on with my experience. And I went the other direction. And I went all the way. To the light? Yes, sir. Hmm. To the arms of God, to be exact. First I met Jesus and people gathered a circle around me and they got to see my life. They got to actually experience every feeling I had. Mm. It's amazing when somebody else is walking your shoes. They felt that rage too. But they held compassion for me. And I held compassion for myself at this point. Then after going through all that, I was led to the Father. My words can't describe that. I'm not who I thought I was. That we can conquer all that we create ourselves to be. And that there is a life loving purpose in all human beings, also, including mine. You know, you wake up from this, and man, I mean. Yeah. Well. Who do you tell? Did you tell? You don't. I, this is the first time I have held this in for five years. And I'm just now coming out because it's time that people knew how much love and how much beauty there is within them and that even they may have rage or fear or whatever things I had that they can remove them and master them, be who they are, be all that they are inside. We've heard so many people who have just the positive experience, the light, they get to see God, they, 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 it, it's wonderful. And they'll report that they really weren't such a great person. They may have done bad things, but yet they got to go right to the light. Why did Were you I... that bad that you went to hell? No, but it was important for me to experience myself and be accountable for all that I had created in my life and also to be purified by the hell did and you... that I may walk in the sight of God. Were, were you bad or were you the victim of bad things? A lot of things happen to me, but yes, we create them to some extent. I mean, I have an issue with saying, hey, hey, it's I created a, this, okay? It's a tough line. It really it? is, and it's a fine line to bear, but what I'm saying is we have destination A, and we know we're going to get to destination B, but how we get there, we create. But what a powerful lesson for the people watching who themselves were hurt, were abused, who yes, feel sir. shame and rage and fear, yes. and it feels like they themselves are bad, and your experience says, you take a stand. I'm here to say that we are not our circumstances. Right. We are not our feelings. We are much more than that. That's and right. we do not have to buy the exterior to know the inside. Well, listen right. to you, though, and don't have to go to hell yourself to, to, to learn no. that lesson. No. Is that your mission now? Is that what you're about, to, to tell people this? Yes, I'm a messenger. Did this affect your baby? Yeah. Actually, yes, it did. 
How so? Was, Tell us. She was born with cancer. Oh. And um, since then, the cancer has been removed. It came out as a form of a tear on her eye, and it was really amazing. They take it off, and she's whole. Why is it when Christians have a near-death experience, they meet Jesus, but non-Christians don't meet Jesus, and there are many more non-Christians than there are Christians? I never stated I was Christian. My parents grew up in their beliefs, and I was a heathen. I led astray from the rod. And, and what belief was theirs? They were Mormon, Baptist, So and they were Christians. They were Christians, yes. Yeah. Well, you know what, really, the question that's being, you sound like, you know, prosecution, rest, sit down, that's, you know. <laughs> but I think that, no, really, the point here is that are some of the images that come forward to terrify you or to convey love in some ways connected to the religious or belief systems that are part of our heritage. That seems almost... Yeah, did we create study. that in our belief systems of religious background? Is that what you're asking? The answer is no. I kind of conjured that up. No. When you were face-to-face uh, -face with these demons, each one, did you recognize then that they were you, or did you reject that, that this was some energy coming out of you? Somehow I knew that it wasn't me. Somehow, I don't know how, but I knew there was some good in me somewhere. Did you have any premonitions of this happening or fear of this happening to you? Never. Happened? I was grander than life. Nobody worked going to tell me how to run my life or how my body was going to be. And I was the last one to ever think I was going to die three weeks after having a baby. Mm. In fact, I went hiking that day mm. three weeks after having a baby. When we come back, a woman's self-inflicted gunshot takes her to the edges of hell. People who've had terrifying near-death experiences. Joining me now is Pat Young. Pat, you actually survived a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the neck. What was going on in your life? It's a time of my life I don't like to talk about because it was so trying on my children and I. Um, but I knew I had to do something drastic enough to force outside help or intervention. So mm. that's what I did to get it. Wow. Your near-death experience after this event was terrifying. It was the, the worst possible situation you could ever imagine. I was aware of being in a straight-back chair but I was completely rigid. I was not able to move anything but my eyes. I, I couldn't move my head or anything. And very small, child-sized, extremely grotesque little beings seemed to be preparing me. I was aware that they were preparing me for something, but they were doing so by having fun themselves. And they were... This was gross. They were shooting me and making holes in me all over my body, my legs, my neck, my cheek, my eye socket, anywhere. And they were putting anything that was horrible in them, excrement, vomit, bile, anything that was absolutely hideous, and and you you don't feel the pain, but you're totally aware of of the uh, the smell, the the feeling, and the everything. disgust, the the, the, the absolute grotesqueness, and it makes you extremely nauseated, and you can't gag, you can't cough, you I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything but breathe. They they had their fun, and I was ready for whatever. And just beyond my right shoulder, I could hear a violent, raspy breathing, heavy, hot, raspy breathing, and a stench that was beyond anything I have ever smelled before. And I've smelled cesspools in rotting flesh and everything, and this was a stench beyond anything that I had ever smelled. And it was getting closer. And I was totally aware that as soon as that whatever came within my view, that
that absolute pure evil was going to overtake me and anything I had gone through up till then was minor, very small. And I was absolutely petrified. And at the very last instant, the very last instant, when I knew that the very next breath would bring that vision into my line of, of view, I, I screamed out in, in my mind, I screamed out as loud as I could, oh God, please help me. And that, oh, there I go, goosebumps. <laughs> and um, that very instant, that very instant, I opened my eyes and I was alive. So I had this just totally overpowering, overwhelming feeling of, of good and love and total contentment. Now that's very interesting, Pat. You have this feeling of good and love and total contentment without having to go through the near-death experience of the light. You, you had it just by not being yes, where you were. Yes, very instant, yeah. Were you a very bad person all your life that you deserved this? I certainly wouldn't like to think so, no. I can't imagine you being that bad. No. <laughs> you said you didn't feel pain, but were you terrified? I was beyond terrified. I was totally beyond terrified. Are you afraid to die now? No. Well, why not? Because I know what love is out there. And I'm looking for it. Strangely, people have asked me that. And, and I said, oddly enough, I'm sort of looking forward to it because I want to feel that love again. The, the ultimate, the most love. You have no fear you'll go back to that place? No. Why do you think this happened to you? I often wondered, but the biggest thing I can think of is it was God's little nudge to, to let me know I, I think I sense a lot of people are somewhat doubting this and don't believe it, but I used to work in an emergency room back home, and they brought a teenage, when she was 18 years old, she had just delivered a baby. They flew her in from where she had previously died. She died five times. We brought her back three times. She died at the old hospital. They flew her on the helicopter. She died in the helicopter. She died three times at the hospital where we were. And they felt for sure that this girl would never make it, but she ended up walking out of the hospital three months later with just blindness. She became fully blind, but she made it. And the doctors often wondered what happened during the time she died, what brought her back. Yeah. So who knows? A lot of people are afraid to talk about this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because especially when you don't have the good one, you're supposed to have the good one, aren't you? That's right. Have you heard about a near-death experience, Pat, before you... You had this experience? I never heard of it. You never heard thing. of the white light and all that? I've never heard of such a thing so. before. Yes, I wonder if uh, any of you feel that you've had a spiritual awakening as a result of this, and uh, has this changed your feelings about uh, heaven and hell? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Um, I value my body more than I ever have my last car, and my body is a vessel to hold what's good. And value others. Yeah. Pat, same for you. Oh, definitely. You, you can't have, feel that much evil without knowing that there has to be that much love. And when you feel the love, there's nothing else you want more. When we return, another chilling account of hell. Near-death experiences that take people to hell. Joining me now is Reverend Ronald Reagan. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, <laughs> good to have you here. Uh, well, leading up to this uh, trauma, this near-death, uh, what was going on? It was the summer of 1972, Will. Um, I was 25 years old. I'd taken my son to the grocery store. My life was, was full of violence and hatred, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol. Got in a fight at the grocery store. Uh, the guy said something I didn't like. I just, I just popped him. and uh, He fell in a case of broken bottles. Got up with a 16-ounce broken bottle and just stabbed me, carved me up, and several death stabs. Your son is there? Yeah, I'm five years old. Hysterical, screaming, just, uh, man. So you have this horrific uh, wound. You're stabbed yeah. to death. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your near-death experience. The guy that run the store uh, came over and said, if you don't get to the hospital right away, you're going to bleed to death. 
So he drove me to the hospital a couple miles away. When they got me there, I was already almost unconscious. The, the floorboard was full of blood. Uh, my son was still screaming, hysterical. I could hear the emergency room attendants saying, we, we can't help him. We've got to transport him to another hospital. They're giving me IVs and blood and doing what they can to help me. Load me up in an ambulance. Uh, about that time, my wife arrived. She climbed in the ambulance with me, uh, some 20-mile journey to another hospital. A young paramedic uh, leaned down in my face and started uh, started talking something about religion. And I didn't I didn't know what he was talking about. I was uh, I cursed him, and, uh, cursed his God, cursed Jesus. Uh, that's just the kind of person I was. And uh, not not uh, not a good set of recommendations to go up to the to the light. No, no. But you know, I'd already been cut, I'd been shot, I'd been beat half to death most of my life, been abused, been in a reform school for shedding blood, human life when I was 15 years old. And uh, you know, I guess really I was headed where I belonged. You know, but uh, who cared at that point? In my life, you know, was was my feeling. But uh, the young guy leaned over to me and said. Uh, Sir, you need you need help. You really need help. And uh, when I cursed him, and when I took the name of God in vain, I thought the ambulance exploded. It, it filled with smoke, flames, just filled the ambulance, and uh, all, immediately I felt like I was moving at a tremendous rate of speed uh, through, the, through the thick black clouds and smoke. And, and almost instantly I began to hear a multitude of voices screaming and, and, and pain and anxiety. And it's been 22 years ago and I, it's still hard for me to talk about it. But as I came through this this black cloud, almost like a tunnel, and came out over and, and looked down in what appeared to be a, a quarry hole or a, or a volcano. And it, it was filled with people screaming and burning. And, and as I'm coming down over that, it's, it's like uh, the smell is unbearable. Uh, the, the emotional pain and anxiety, the atmosphere is so heavy with something that, that I really don't understand. I've, I've seen pain. I've, I've saw people die in the street in their own blood. But this was something I didn't understand. And I've actually never been afraid of anything until this point. But I, I didn't understand it. And then, like a close-up lens on a camera... The, the faces, at least half a dozen faces, came up out of the, the pit. And I recognized them as friends that I've known in years past that had died tragic or violent deaths. One had been shot to death in a, in a robbery attempt that I was involved in. One had died an overdose of drugs. Two had died drunk in an automobile accident. And they're all screaming my name and saying, Ronnie, don't come here. There's no way out. There's no escape. Don't come here. And it's like I, I don't want to believe this, but I can smell it. I can see it. I can feel it. I can hear it. And it, it's terrifying. Loneliness. Grief. Heartache. I have to ask you, you know, you're a preacher, but you became a preacher subsequent to this. Yes. As you hear colleagues who haven't had this experience, and the classic experience for many Americans is hell and damnation and the descriptions of hell that seem to come out so glibly, you've experienced it in a more three-dimensional way. Are we scaring people inappropriately? I mean, well, I can only speak for myself. You know, I've, I've looked down the barrel of 357 or an Uzi. You know, I was a biker. I was. This all happened in the '60s and '70s. Um, some people need a different way of getting their attention. 
You know, that's just the plain truth. And I was one of those people, and I'm sure there's a multitude of people like me. But as horrible as this was, as painful as it was, and I was a rat of a husband, a low-down dad, couldn't hold a job, but, but this had a very positive impact on my life after. Turned you around. Tell me how your boy is. He's well. He's a police officer. <laughs> how, <laughs> how appropriate. <laughs> um, another daughter is a minister of music. And four grandchildren. Three children. Four grandchildren. It strikes me that, you know, we can approach these experiences. As so many topics we have on the, on the show from a belief or not belief, but what is persuasive is this experience, whether it was inside you or outside you, turned four lives around, changed lives, changed paths of lives, and that seems to be almost undeniably real. We'll be right back. experiences that take us to hell. Joining us now is Nancy Evans Bush, president of the International Association of Near Death Studies. These sound just incredible. Are they are they typical? If the incredible can be typical, these experiences are so vivid and you'll notice that no two are alike. But each of them contains just such incredible power. Which is that um, there's no two alike? Is that because uh, hell is like a person's state of mind? What they think it is? Yeah, how personal is this uh, to people? If you look at images of hell from all around the world from centuries past, it's as if there's a cluster of images. Uh, so, for example, Steve had a lake of fire. A lake of fire is, is a very ancient yeah, Dante, Dante yes. described the lake of fire. Hi, my question is for Teresa. I wanted to know why have you waited so long to tell your story for the first time? I waited because I intuitively am very close to the Lord, and it was time. Uh, my experience was so extensive that I'm really not sure that it could have been embraced before now. And it's time to come out now because it's time that people recognize the good and be accountable for that which they put on others. I appreciate all the stories that you told, but I, I'm very skeptical for this reason. The human body is chemically induced. There's a lot of things, like if you smell bread, you feel euphoric, or perfume, or music. So uh, it's natural for you, if you're knocked out for some reason, and you think you're dead, and your chemistry is changing, that you're going to have a lot of thoughts running through your head. And that this would trigger things from within yourself, right. images of chemically, your own. Right. Chemically, you're going to experience things based on what's flowing through. Like if, if you're going to meditate, you're going to get a certain rhythm in your brain, and this is going to be natural. It's a bombardment of the senses. It's going to be a more sort of plausible scientific okay. explanation. Can I answer that? Sure. When a person is dead, they measure their brain activity or electrical impulses. What happens when you're dead? Now, what happens when you're dead? You're zipped. So how do you get something out of nothing? Were you, all, were you all anesthetized at the time? No, you had sir, your, I was not. Near-death experience? May I comment on that, too? We are physiological creatures, and so every experience we have is mediated through biochemistry, bioelectricity, bio something or other. That's the only way we have of experiencing anything. The difficulty is, I think, when we mistake the trigger, the mechanism for the experience. Yeah. And there's the difference. My question is, the experiences that you guys, that you guys had, um, maybe you guys changed, right? Um, if you guys wouldn't have had that experience. Would it make a difference? You would explain that very much to me. I hated men. I was full of rage. I was grandiose, and I did not appreciate my body or good health. Now, Other than that, you were a swell person. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm softer. I'm gentler. I'm kinder. Um, I'm caring. I'm compassionate, and I'm very alive now. I live life by the moment. Good for you, Steve. What about you? 
Obviously they've changed, yes, drastically. Um, would I have? Probably not. Um, I would still be selling cocaine. Um, one of the most interesting things I've seen lately uh, is on the back of cars, you see those fish, you know? You've seen the Darwin with the little leg, this is Darwin. And I talked to a guy one time, one of the pastors, and said, uh, you know, about that. And Darwin, shortly before he died, rebuked everything that he had predicted and, and made statements on. My question is for Ron. Did the man who stabbed you in the store do have any experiences like you went through? Oh, interesting. Yeah, whatever became of him. And the last account I heard, he was still in prison. <laughs> he had just gotten out of prison for stabbing. Uh, to my knowledge, he's you know he's he's never had any experiences like like I have. Mr. Reagan, would you please explain to us what it felt like to come back from the other side? None of you, to the best of my recollection, have told us about that, but I'd like to hear from you specifically. Yeah, the reentry. Yes, sir. Uh, the reentry for me uh, was like an electric shock. When, I, when my eyes popped open in the hospital some 24 hours later, and my wife was standing by saying, you've made it. But uh, all I could see or all I could think of was, was where I had just been. And having never been afraid of anything before, it was totally different now. I didn't want, I didn't want the lights uh, off. I wanted lights on all the time. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I asked myself, am I... What is this? You know, what, what's happening to me? And the impulses of just be quiet, don't tell anybody about it. You know, just just shaking inside and yet feeling a, a, an overwhelming sense of, of almost being a different person coming back. At, does, it, does it make it worse that you can't tell? For instance, does it make it easier when you tell? It, it, it disperses that energy. It does. And it helps heal. As well as coming back into my body, I felt like I was being crushed by a bulldozer. So that's something Literally. to tell people maybe who be sitting on these experiences at home that to confide it in somebody safely might be helpful to them. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that by telling people your experience that they'll be a better believer in God and not so much a believer by themselves? I share of my heart. My heart speaks of God's love. I don't preach, I give it away. And if it touches and inspires another person to see how great they are, then I will have been done. We'll be right back.